don't know what to say after touching ass. I'm not going to go there. Uh, I can't conceive what to say after that. Um, so I want to kick it off. Stairway to heaven. I know it's, it's not a great place to be between you and your cocktail and spirit of choice on a Friday evening. I'm the last one between that. Uh, but the topic is stairway to heaven, so we can have a spirited conversation in a different sense. And we'll sharpshoot it and we'll talk about, uh, you know, how we can have the right strategies to be successful in winning this battle and reaching the stairway to customer heaven in today's world. So growing up in the 80s, uh, for me, uh, you know, in, in college, I couldn't help being a, a, a classic rock fan. And especially I was a big fan of Led Zeppelin, uh, amongst other bands. And even as of last week, when we had Halloween, I was trying to channel my inner Led Zeppelin and kind of to bring my Robert Plant personality in there. It didn't work very great. But when I look back 30 years after, what I didn't realize is that that same Led Zeppelin song, Stairway to Heaven, can be a great framework for us B2B marketers on how to win the battle and how to reach the stairway to customer heaven, especially in today's world where the customer has all the power and they drive the decision and customer experience has become the basis of competitive advantage. So what I'm going to do is share with you the five A's of scaling to reach the customer, to reach customer heaven and some practical tips along the way on what we want to do in each of these five A's. So it starts with awareness. All marketing starts with awareness and what we're going to do on the awareness side. Then acquisition. We've had some great conversations in account-based marketing. John Miller, the great John Miller kicked it off today. Just some practical tips on acquisition. And then adoption. What do we want to do in the area of adoption? I can talk about that. Add-ons. You know, when do we sell the right things to customers? And ultimately, the big one, advocacy. As we go and ultimately, how do we scale each of these steps as marketers to ultimately open that gate and share some tips on what are the angels of engagement so that we can you know, not have the demons of defection uh, and as we go forward. So that's kind of the, the, the plan today and share with you some practical tips. So let's start with awareness. Anybody see the Nike ad which talks about this lightest shoe, 11.2 ounce, ultra fast technology, inset woven grip, Airbeat Sonic 3.0. Anybody seen the Nike ad? Nobody, because that was a test question. There is no Nike ad that talks about the lighter shoe with the ultra fast technology, the inset woven grip. Because what Nike does is it doesn't market to you at the head about features. It visually tries to connect to us, right? When he has Colin Kaepernick saying that when something means something, it's, it's okay to sacrifice everything. You guys have seen the ad. It's trying to hit you here, not trying here. It's the visceral emotional reaction. And the great brands have used that emotion as a weapon of mass influence to build that connection with us, right? Now, that stuff is easy to do when you're a B2C brand, right? We wake up having human needs and wants in B2C, but as human beings, we don't wake up and start saying, today I want network routers and ERP software or, or, or some marketing software. We, just, we don't yearn for B2B products. And the second challenge we have today is for every Nike, there's hundreds of brands that are trying to say, do this mass marketing. And as John might have showed you this morning too, is... Nobody's listening. Everybody is talking and nobody is listening. And that's what's happening. There's about 3,000 messages per day that's been thrown out there. And it's very, very little attention spans for us to listen to it. So this concept of mass marketing that we're doing in B2B, of trying to have one message to everybody, even through brand awareness, doesn't work. So what works? In B2B, one idea to think about is shift from mass marketing for awareness to educational marketing. Now, the foundation of educational marketing in B2B for building awareness is this principle that teaching your prospects great to be in, your, in their function to earn the right to engage. As marketers, we need to earn the right to engage today given all the noise out there. And people give you the earn, give you, they give you the right to engage when you're teaching them something, when you're appealing to their selfish gene of learning as much as the altruistic gene of anything else. So we got to teach people on how do they become better in their functions to ultimately, whether it's marketing or procurement or, or, or sales or whatever they do in terms of being educational about it. And the philosophy there is there's a great book called The Challenge of Sale by Matthew Dixon and Brett Adamson that kind of institutionalized this thought that you teach for differentiation as a brand, you tailor this teaching contextual to what 
a person's background, persona, industry, region, etc. And then you take control of the selling process as B2B marketers. Right? So that kind of concept of teaching and building that educational gene to us as marketers is important for us in building brand awareness because sending one message to everybody on the Chicago airport billboard is good spend. Your CEO is going to like it for three days and then it's going to say, okay, where's the ROI on that? And where's the pipeline on that? So it's a lot better to kind of look at it from an educational marketing perspective. Now, interestingly, folks, is to do that, let's take a couple of tips, right? From my personal experience, is kind of follow the 411 rule of educating people through content. And the 411 rule is very simple, which says that for every six pieces of content we use as marketers to educate our customers, four can be about educating them, one can be semi-self-serving about your brand, and one can be self-serving about your brand. For example, if you want to talk about your great products that you've released or talk about some customer stories, that's good. But you got to balance the boat there by making, uh, imbalance the boat there where you need to have more stories about education through content as opposed to trying to sell your product. And that's the basis of educational marketing. Now, the other thing that, another thing for educational marketing, an important tip is follow the Taco Bell strategy. Now, those of us who've been to Taco Bell, especially late at night when nothing else is open, we see like, if you look at Taco Bell, there's about six or seven ingredients. There's chicken, there's beans, there's pico de gallo, there's guacamole, there's sour cream and, extra, and a few other things. But they got lots of dishes. They get six ingredients and create lots and lots of dishes. So can we take the Taco Bell strategy and adopt it for our content and teaching in terms of taking few pieces of content and creating snackable items for it when it comes to teaching people? It's a great strategy to adopt. Think about the 411 rule and think about how do you take a Taco Bell strategy in terms of creating content. Now, the other aspect of content creation is for educational marketing is to build brand awareness is brand association, getting that Brangelina effect. If you think about it, if you look at, you know, for some example at Coupa, for example, if we have Coupa and we want to go after CFOs, it's easier for me to have going after CFOs when I have the economist as a partner for thought leadership because that gives that credibility as a brand to go do that. So when you're doing educational marketing, invest in third party thought leadership that can, that can up level the perception of your brand to go do that. And while we do that, what's important for us is understand this term called ROKI. We all know Romi as marketers, return on marketing investment. Roki is return on content investment. For every dollar we spend on this content, we want to understand when you're doing educational marketing, how much of pipeline and bookings are we sourcing and how much of pipeline and bookings are we investing. So to net it out, the first level, the first stairway to heaven, acquisition, focus and shift from mass marketing to educational marketing. That's kind of one. Okay, we're up the stairway. We'll talk about the next thing is acquisition. There's been lots of great talk about different acquisition strategies, etc. How many of us are Stranger Things fans here? Anybody? Okay, there's a few of us, so there'll be contextual to the Stranger Things folks. Um, there's this concept in Stranger Things, the show about this upside down, which is an alternate reality. And what is happening in marketing today is kind of the same upside down thing where you've gone from a world where it's predominantly lead-based marketing and a little bit of account-based marketing to a world where the upside down it's flipped, where it's predominantly account-based marketing and few lead-based marketing. Now, I don't want to spend any time talking about why, except there's a lot of luminaries this today have talked about this, about how the democratization of software has led us into this more alignment between sales and marketing, bringing that together. So I'm going to skip that, but offer some practical stuff that's worked for us uh, in, this, in, in this area. Now, why do this at the end of the day is, it sounds fancy, but sales has been doing account-based selling for years. The idea to do this is ultimately it's to win bigger, win more, and win faster collectively as a sales and marketing organization. And that's why we want to do this. Now, the job of marketing as I look at this, when you collectively go and do, do a set of target accounts, because the idea is if sales is opening the doors at 10 target accounts, let marketing try to help open the same doors and color the skies, your favorite brand color for those personas who sales is engaging with. So for example, my job at Coupa is to color the skies Coupa blue in terms of all the channels when that prospect looks up, when sales is engaging, we're hitting them on own channels, we're hitting them on paid channels, we're hitting them on earned channels, et cetera, 
to build that brand awareness together and go drive pipeline and ultimately bookings from that perspective, right? And that's kind of the idea of sales and marketing doing together. Now, the big practical tip, everybody knows this, and everybody says, duh, we can do this, makes sense. What stops us from doing it? And here is what stops us from doing it. Historically, what has happened is we've had discrete dimensions of demand generation that's happening in B2B software. And what I mean by that is typically what happens in a company is when you do the marketing mix for an organization, you say sales generates 30% of the pipeline, marketing generates 50%, and partners generate 20%. You kind of look at it in these silos, and then you have these programs where marketing is doing this, sales is doing that, and then you start getting into where's the attribution, et cetera. That works in a world where you have different swim lanes of very discrete demand generation dimensions. That doesn't work in a world where sales and marketing is going after the same set of target accounts. That doesn't work because you're all going after the same accounts. There's no concept of 50% and 20% here. You're all going after the same accounts in the account-based marketing world. So at Cooper, for example, this was a few years ago, kind of we had these silos. And when we bought this together, prospects started looking really good. I mean, really, really good. That's what happened. Really good, these prospects were. No laughs, one, two. He was, my, my sales guy said that Brad Pitt looks like him, so he was trying to get the, the, uh, the compliment there. But really it's about bringing these two together and driving this from that perspective. And what that means for us practically, very practically, is going from this mix of sales does 30%, partner does 20%, and marketing does uh, 30%, this concept of inbound and outbound, the concept of all bound. And all bound really means sales and marketing are together. We co-drive all pipeline as opposed to having discrete dimensions of pipeline generations in that perspective. So that's the practical aha. So if you look at acquisition, if you figured everything else I said today, one thing to remember is align your sales and marketing to be all bound as opposed to looking at inbound, outbound, et cetera. So we're going up the chain or the stairway here. And the next step is adoption. If you look at marketing spend by B2B marketers, especially in smaller companies, and if you look at the x-axis of the y-axis of the spend, and if you look at the x-axis of, if I, in the customer life cycle, if I went from awareness, acquisition, adoption, add-ons and advocacy, if I just kind of plotted those on the x-axis, it's imbalanced. 85 to 90% of spend today happens in the first two steps of acquisition and awareness and acquisition. And that's what happens today in most B2B companies. Because a lot of times we're thinking that, hey, we have to get pipeline in and we have to get these customers to go win or these prospects to become customers. The sales guy's asking, where's the pipeline? We're not really focused on driving lifetime value of that customer over time from a marketing perspective as much as driving demand and acquisition up front. So the idea there is how do we balance the spend when it comes across the life cycle rather than just focusing it on the first part of this life cycle? And the first step to balancing that spend is adoption marketing. So what is adoption marketing? Very simply is adoption marketing is ensuring that customers fully consume the capability that they've paid for. Because a lot of time what happens is in sales, especially in larger companies, is they say, I got these capabilities. What do you want to buy? Put a bunch of shelfware. Customers never use them. And then when you try to go cross sell more products, they say, wait a minute, I haven't even used the products that I bought from you. Why would I go buy more? And this, the reason why marketing is important today in this it's because historically what we've done is we have addressed this on the left-hand side of this chart, which is through customer account managers. If you look at the life cycle, somebody's become a customer, sales has transitioned this to account management. And these account managers saying, oh, you have this capability. I'm going to give you some you know, one-on-one -on -one sessions on these new features that you have bought, that you haven't used, et cetera. Scales when you have 40 customers. Doesn't scale when you have 400 customers and surely doesn't scale when you get to 1,000 customers. So the idea of adoption marketing is one to many, where you can run marketing programs 
that is teaching customers on the capability that they have bought, partnering with the education team so that they can start adopting the features. Because you cannot increase lifetime value of a customer until they've adopted everything they've bought in the first place. And that's a big challenge in software companies today. And there's a lot of skeletons in the cupboard. And I was at IBM and we were famous for, I'll sell you everything I got. In three years, 60% of what they bought went back because they never used it. So that's a very important thing for us to look at in terms of adoption marketing. And my aha for you in adoption marketing is I'm gonna go Nike on you and say, just do it. Because 99% of companies don't do it. Anybody here as an adoption marketing person in your team? Okay, sir, that is one, two, three, four. So that is 20% of the room or 10% of the room. That's actually progressive. When I joined, I was CMO at Marketo. When I joined Marketo, we didn't have an adoption marketing person. When I left, we had a person dedicated for adoption marketing. And even today at Cooper, we have one person doing that. And the value is, it's a one-to-many value that you can start socializing and having programmatic impact on features and functions that customers have bought and they can start using. So that is very, very important for us to go up the stairway before we get to add-ons because nobody will buy more till they've bought, they've used what they've bought. So then the question is, how do we go sell more capability to customers? Right? A lot of us in SaaS businesses, how many of us are in SaaS businesses here? Okay, there's about 50% of the room here. So we know that the game is about lifetime value. Because ultimately the game is if customers stay with us longer and they pay us more and they shout from the rooftop, life's pretty good in a SaaS business, right? That's really what the value of a SaaS business is and that's lifetime value. But to get to that, you have to sell more. But to sell more, you have to get adoption. But even after you get adoption, what do you sell? When do you sell it? And we all know as, you know, those of us who did engineering at college, we knew when we were undergrad, like you're not ready for your third semester math class when you enter college. This is the first semester, second semester, progressive math, pr progressive education that goes on. And the best way, the framework that I have seen work on doing cross-sell and add-on marketing is using a business maturity model or what I call a maturity model for a customer. Once you have a critical mass of customers, let's just say 30, 50 customers, you can create a maturity model which says, based on the pattern, you're connecting us, you're drawing a straight line, not through one or two data points, but to about 30, 50, 70 data points. And you're saying, my customers, if you look at the maturity and the value that my offering is giving, are in these phases of stage one, they typically consume these products, in stage two, they typically consume these products. And in stage three, they typically consume, or it could be stage four, whatever. Some companies have three, some companies have four, et cetera. But the point is, there's a progressive profiling of capability for your customer journey that programmatically that we have to look at. And companies, when they're small, don't do it. But for us to scale and really be very effective in cross-sell marketing and add-ons, we have to do that. Example at Coupa. I mean, we did our maturity model where we say that you go from the st stage one, a set of capabilities, to stage two, a set of capabilities, to stage three, a set of capabilities. And then we can say, if a customer is in stage one, I'm not gonna go cross sell a product that is typically in stage three adoption into a stage two, in, into them before they get to stage two. So marketing is guided in terms of the programs they want to run. Here is when your product marketing and your demand gen teams have to align with your customer success to really understand this framework to go scale this. And that's very, very important for companies. It's okay when you have 20 people, when you have 50 customers, it doesn't matter. When you have 500 customers and you wanna make lifetime value as your big goal, this matters. So that is my guidance for you is, think about a maturity model as a framework for us to go programmatically do add-on selling. All right, so we've talked awareness. We're almost, ready for our beers. We've talked awareness, we've talked acquisition, we've talked adoption, we've talked add-ons, and let's talk about the most important thing, advocacy, right? And advocacy is very important today, as we all know, and I'll make a cop Captain Obvious slide here uh, from my friend Vinay Bhagat, the CEO of Trust Radius, which is like, Everything we do, and I use the term, it's a peer bound world. I use the word all bound from a demand generation perspective. From an advocacy perspective, I'll use the term peer bound because we get influenced in B2B as much as B2C 
and what our peers are saying as much as what the, much more than what the vendors are saying. In everything we buy, in Yelp, we go to Yelp, in B2B, in B2C, the same thing, there's products like G2 Crowd, Trust Radius, et cetera, that are trying to drive this concept of peer bound worlds. Now, interestingly, when it comes to advocacy, this is what I have seen a lot of us confuse. We confuse loyalty with advocacy. And it's very important for us to understand the delineation between loyalty and advocacy. If you think about it, this guy's hands are chained. And if that was me, that would be my airline company. Right? Because it's locked in loyalty. Statistically, I'm loyal. I've been with them for 12 years because I'm locked in. I got this mileage stuff, I can't go, I'm trapped, I'm locked in. But am I an advocate of the brand? I'm actually a mad advocate of the brand recently and what's happening, right? I'm not sitting from the rooftop and, and, shout, and you know, singing their praises, especially when the skies haven't been that friendly for them recently. I wouldn't name the brand, but you guys get it. Uh, but the point is, loyalty should not be confused with advocacy. And advocates are people who are really passionate, like this guy. We swapped out the Whopper for a Wendy's burger to see what would happen. This is clearly a Wendy's burger. Clearly. Right. Okay, they, they have the square patty. I hate Wendy's. What's going on? I, I eat Burger King. I don't eat Wendy's. What can I do to resolve this? All I want is a Whopper. Okay. Get me a Whopper. Okay. There's the boss. <laughs> we didn't pull a prank on you. Whopper. Anything else is a freaking disappointment. It is. Get out this thing. Oh. Now that's an advocate, right? That's what we want. Difficult in B2B. And really, when we look at ourselves as companies, we have this 99-1 ratio. We have lurkers, likers, and lovers, right? This, I would do the 19, 90% are probably lurkers, 9% are, or 80, 80, 19, 80, 18, 2 ratio, likers and lovers. And our goal is to really move lurkers to likers and likers to lovers and, and stuff. And one interesting thing I have learned in my career, you know, doing advocacy marketing is sometimes people confuse your most highest paid customers as your biggest advocates. And there is no direct correlation there. And sometimes there's an inverse correlation there. Sometimes people, especially in the developer community or in the marketing community, may not pay a lot of money to your brand, but they have a tribal association with your brand in terms of building the community, and they are heavy advocates of your brand. At Marketo, that's what we found. There was no correlation between the guys who paid us the most money and the people who would shout from the rooftop about how great our brand was. So think about this. Don't take your Salesforce report and says, and descending order of ARR and say, let's go look at the first 10 customers and say that these are my biggest advocates. Not true. Really find people who are passionate about your brand and in your communities and stuff and really start showcasing their stories from that perspective. That's my lesson learned kind of on, on that piece. Now, when it comes to advocacy, historically as B2B marketers, we have done advocacy, we have promoted advocacy on our own channels, on our own channels, website. You go to a website, there's some great customer stories saying this product is great. And on our website, every baby is good looking. Every B2B's website, software company's website, the baby is always good looking. But when you go to some other earned channels and ask customers, if you put the polygraph on them, the baby's not that good looking. There are some ugly babies in software, right? As much as we always say that in B2B, that it's all good looking babies when it comes to our own channels. And that's why it's important to keep this. And it's okay for some people to say that the baby is not that good looking. You look at Glassdoor, right? Nobody gets a 5.0 rating as a product on Glassdoor, or as a company, sorry, on Glassdoor. There are some negative reviews. That's okay, because that brings the authenticity of the brand. Not every, no software company is perfect. In fact, that's why I say, one of the things I've been saying is that we talk about this at the age of AI, the age of artificial intelligence. It's actually the age of authentic interactions, the other AI, as much as it's the age of artificial intelligence, because a brand like has just like we tell ourselves be be yourself to be successful and you are who you are and that's the same thing for a brand a brand is what a brand is and don't try to be anything else but authentic about your brand and which means 
From that perspective, the practical implication of that, it sounds esoteric and great in a, in a keynote presentation, but what does it really mean from, a, from an actionable perspective? Is it means that you should look at investing your voice of customer, your advocacy initiative in earned channels more than just your own channels because your customers are going to trust that or your prospects are going to trust that, right? I, I ran a recent event, uh, an executive luncheon, where uh, we had 120 people in the room. There was about 60 customers and 50 prospects, uh, 50 customers and 60, uh, 60 prospects in the room. And this is all C-level people and VPs of people. My sales guys were chomping at the bits and they're like, how come we're not invited? We have prospects in the room. It's, it's terrible that you didn't invite any sellers. And I said, wrong. You got 50 of your best sellers sitting in the room. They happen to be your customers, right? There's no better seller than that, than our own sales team trying to go sell this. And that's really, really important for us is bring that authenticity and in earned channels, you can get that authenticity, whether it's G2, Trust Radius or other channels, et cetera, uh, and, and bring that voice of customer initiatives in that. Now, that's one part of advocacy. How do you tell your customers to be authentic uh, about your brand? Of course, you got to lead the witness as marketers. We're all marketers, right? You just can't, don't want them to give you one on five ratings on everything. But it's, it's okay to sprinkle one or two. In fact, the research shows that having negative reviews actually helps the brand more than just having positive reviews. Uh, and the research has actually shown that in B2B as, as, as Trust Radius has shown. And then the last piece in advocacy is we always think of advocacy from a customer perspective and how do we get customers to be advocates? Where's Karen Steele? Is she here in this room? She's probably not. And she's the, she was, when I was at Marketo, I had the pleasure of supporting her on corporate marketing uh, when she was running corporate marketing for me. One of the interesting things is about building advocacy inside out. Great brands are built inside out. Happy employees make happy customers. How many of us have been to Walt Disney? Disneyland, I'm sure every hand goes up here. Unless everybody is ready to get out and go have their, their, their wine right now. Two more minutes, but everybody, so but that's the thing, advocacy, happy employees make happy customers, it's the happiest place on earth. But as a brand, we can reflect that and say happy employees make happy customers. And we have to invest in employee engagement as much as we do in custo, uh, employee advocacy as much as customer advocacy. So to recap, again, there's a good chance you'll forget 95% of what I said today. It's a very good chance in 20 minutes you'll be sitting there and saying, what did he say? Let me just recap this for the water cooler. Awareness, to hit the stairway to Evan, the first step is always awareness. All marketing starts with awareness. Focus on educational marketing rather than mass marketing. Acquisition, don't have sales and marketing separate. Shift to an all bound approach where marketing and sales are together driving all pipe and going forward. Adoption marketing, just do it. Invest in people and program dollars to do it. It's gonna help you over the long run. Add-ons, when do you sell cross-sell? Use a maturity model, understands what your customer journey is, put it in a framework and work with your marketing teams to sell it at the right time for the right customer at the right stage in the journey. And advocacy, shift, earned, shift your customer advocacy to earn channels and then build your advocacy, implied, invest in employee advocacy to build it inside out. We do that, we are not only at the gates of heaven, but we can actually open the stairway to heaven as marketers, because ultimately the one metric that matters, the Mufasa metric, the Lion King of all metrics in a SaaS business is lifetime value. And ultimately for us to go up this stairway and get the Led Zeppelin in us will make us have maximized lifetime value and life will be about rock and roll for all of us. Thank you, cheers.